Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. My name is Brandon Boone. I'm on the YouTube team at Google. As you think of questions throughout the conversation, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right side. I'm very excited to in introduce today's guest because I'm also a big fan. Today, we get to hear from the famous Emmanuel Acho. If you've, unless you've been here uh, under a rock, um, he's currently a Fox Sports analyst and a former, and former NFL player with the Eagles. Today, he is here to talk about his career, his YouTube series, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, which has an amazing 70 million views in just the first eight months. Um, the show has been such a huge hit that Emmanuel got a chance to write a book by the same name. And of course, it shot straight to the top of the charts, and now it's the New York Times bestseller. Emmanuel, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Before we get started, man, I'm up, my man. <laughs> yeah, man, how you doing? Um, before we get I'm started, good, dude. I'm good. Go, ahead, say, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I have to say, congrats. I have to say, congratulations. Um, I want to thank you uh, for setting such an amazing example for some of the people around the world. You, in a short period of time, uh, you've been able to elevate and, and normalize one of the most taboo topics uh, on the on the planet. Um, and from one black man to another, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, so enough of me talking, though. Let's get into a comfortable conversation with a black man. Um, first off, like, where are you? Like, I know you're from Texas. Um, are you safe? Man, I, thankfully, I am in California right now. But as for those in Texas, my family is there. They are safe. I've contacted several of my friends, um, and okay. they're thankfully safe as well. Flooding, uh, pipes have burst, but no lives have been lost. And so the uh, tangible things you can replace. And as you get older, you get wiser, you realize life isn't about uh, things you can buy, but the things you can. So thankfully, family and loved ones are safe. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Um, so I guess the first question is a really, is a really easy one. Um, who are you? Uh, lots of people think they know who you are, but I, can, I like to give people a chance to kind of like explain who they are out of their, for, with their own words. Yeah. Um, let me start with this. So I played in the NFL and I would never lead with that, except for Brandon. Over your shoulder, I see a Philadelphia Eagles game ball in a case. I played for the Eagles for three years and never got a game ball. So me and you got beat, Brandon. Me and you are not on good terms right now. Um, I know you worked for the Eagles for about a year or two, so I'm, I'm sad we missed each other. Who is yeah. Emmanuel Acho? Um, son of Nigerian immigrants. My parents came to America late 70s, early 80s. And so I was born uh, in Dallas, Texas, went to an affluent private school called St. Mark's, predominantly white private school, all boys school. We wore uniform. Brandon, I had the gray slacks and the white button down t-shirt. And if you were really fancy and you were a senior at St. Mark's, you wore a blue t-shirt. You felt special. I promise you I did. Now from St. Mark's, I go on to the University of Texas where I am immersed in black culture playing football at Texas, back when Texas was really good. Hopefully they get there again. And then from Texas, I get drafted to the Cleveland Browns in 2012 at the age of 21, traded to the Philadelphia Eagles. After four years playing in the NFL, I hang it up. I was on the roster, off the roster. I realized uh, my life is bigger than football. I instantly get into sports television. I worked for ESPN for two years, then transitioned to work for Fox Sports, where I am now in Los Angeles. And that's when uncomfortable conversations has kind of erupted. And so I'm sure you'll ask me about that. So I won't go ahead and tell it. Um, but in a nutshell, that is who I am. Yeah, that, that's that's a perfect uh, segue into like the next question, which is basically like, what about your background and your upbringing? do you think gives you the license to like have these types of uncomfortable conversations in such a public manner? Man, so more than a license to everybody watching, understand it's all about experience. So I'm gonna take y'all back. Um, I recently realized, Brandon, there's a difference between color and culture. See, I'm black, black by birth, came out the womb black, I'm black. But I grew up Nigerian cultured and white culture. What do you mean, Emmanuel? Let me explain. I grew up listening to Nigerian music from my parents, eating Nigerian food, rice and stew, goat meat, constantly hearing from my parents, you must be a doctor, you must be a lawyer, you must be an engineer, <laughs> like in their thick Nigerian accents, like that's how I grew up. But then Monday through Friday, Brandon, I was going to this affluent school that was predominantly white. And so I often heard, Brandon, I heard, Emmanuel, you don't even talk like you're black or 
Emmanuel, you don't dress like you're black or Brandon, my favorite. Emmanuel, you're like an Oreo, black on the outside, and the choir says, white on the inside. The inside. And Brandon, yep. I had an identity complex. I was like, I think I'm black, but maybe if I don't sag my pants, I, I guess I'm not black, or I guess I sound too educated to be black. So then I said, wait a second, as I got older, what the heck does that mean about what my white friends thought about black people? And so I'll conclude it with this to fully answer your question. I took Spanish from grade seven to 12 in my high school. And my Spanish teacher always told me like so many of y'all, y'all remember, take yourself back to high school. They would say this, if you want to be fluent in a language, you have to immerse yourself in the culture. I'm gonna let y'all sit on that for a second. And well, that's one hundred percent. Let him sit on that for a second. That's okay. it. All right, a little marinate. A little marinate. Just a little bit. Yes. Let, let that one marinate. It has to slow cook in the oven, Brandon, because that'll take a while to digest. If you want to be yes. fluent in a language, you have to immerse yourself in the culture. I was immersed in white culture, in rich, rich white culture, like the richest. And then I go to Texas, and I'm in the NFL, so I'm immersed in black culture. So, Brandon, in May of 2020, after George Floyd was murdered. I realized there's a language disconnect because my black brothers and sisters are saying we're oppressed, systemic racism, police brutality, um, uh, 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 segregation and discrimination. And my white brothers and sisters are like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Then my white brothers and sisters are saying certain things and my black brothers and sisters are like, what are you, what are you talking about? And I realized, there is a language barrier. So because I was fully immersed in white culture and fully immersed in black culture, I've just found myself as a conduit to translate this language so that we can all communicate. Yeah, and I think that that is, you know, like a great insight into you. I think you and I share a lot of the same life experiences. Um, one of the things that I often think about when I speak to, you know, my white friends um, and my white family as well, my, my wife is white and half my family is white. I often think back uh, to like a specific, like the time where I noticed I was different. And I, I use that as an opportunity to help them understand just like how real that moment can be. Did you have a moment like that in your life? I think you, in your book, you talked about it was around 10 years old, that there was a specific thing uh, that, that, that happened to you or a, a specific moment in time. Man, I would say the time was in middle school. It was, so I'm young for my grade. I started school early. So in fifth grade, I was nine years old. So I would say from around nine to 16, when you're navigating predominantly white spaces, you just realize, oh, like, uh, y'all don't think or look necessarily like me. You show up, Brandon, to sporting events in the inner city, and then you see other black people. But you yep. get off the bus on a basketball team with all white people. And all your white friends are looking at you like, all right, Acho need you to show up this game. And it's like, yep. y'all play too. I need y'all to show up. <laughs> and so I think in high school, especially when I would hear the, Emmanuel, you're so smart for a black person. That's when I was like, wait, something's not adding up. Why are we adding that for a black person phrase? Like, wait, that, that yeah. something's not sitting right. And in college is when I realized oh, like all of that was wrong. All of those phrases and, and, and iterations verbally, they were just wrong. And that's probably when I realized I'm different. Now I can't go a day without understanding that, but I'll end by saying this, with great knowledge comes great vexation. We all seek to acquire knowledge in life. We seek to learn more. We seek more wisdom, more understanding. But just remember, the more you learn, the more you're exposed to, uh, the more frustrating it becomes. Just like when you're a kid and you now realize Santa Claus isn't real. I apologize if anybody on this call still believes in Santa Claus. Um, and you're like, man, well, that's unfortunate. And so with yeah. great knowledge becomes great vexation. So the older I got, the more vexed I got by my race. Yes, I hear you. And I do think my kids are actually watching. So Kennedy and Maverick, Santa Claus is real. So don't, don't let him yeah. tell you any it different. And his name is Brandon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, no, but I guess I want to dig into a little bit, a, a little bit of that, a little bit more. So, like, did you have in, when you were in high school or college or middle school? Did you ever experience like any 
like overt racism? Did you ever hear anyone call you a specific name or was there anything that like stuck out in your mind that was like, this was a really traumatic experience for me and it's going to stick with me forever? Let me say it like this, Brandon, and this hopefully is, is very enlightening for all the people on here who I don't know, but I love. Um, there are rungs and degrees of racism, my brothers and my sisters. Please hear me when I say this, if nothing else. In our judicial system, we have degrees of murder. First degree, it's premeditated. You thought about it. Second degree, it's a crime of passion. But then as you move down the rungs of, of murder, you have something called involuntary manslaughter. Brandon, it wasn't intentional, but it still led to death. Emmanuel Acho has rarely dealt with first degree racism. See, first degree racism, I'm intentionally saying the N word to inflict emotional damage onto you. First degree racism, slavery. Second degree yeah. racism, George Floyd's murder, a crime of passion that still has some racial motivation. What I often deal with, Brandon, is that third degree racism. You know, that, yeah. that, that the, 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 you're so smart to be black. Emmanuel, I love these uncomfortable conversations. I just wish all black people were more like you. Or Emmanuel, you're just, you're a different black guy. You know, is it, going to a store, Brandon, if I'm going to a Rolex store, cause I'm a, I'm a watch guy. I'm like, you know what? I have to wear my current Rolex into a Rolex store. They're not gonna take me seriously. Cause I'll go in without yeah. it and they won't even turn an eye. You know, or or walking down the street pre-COVID and, and, a, and, a, and a dear white, you know, we'll, I'll call them, I'll use the phrase a dear white friend, but a dear white stranger will hit a hard right or a hard left just because I'm a big black 6'2", 240 pound man. So we have to understand to all of y'all watching this, racists are not the biggest issue in America. Racial ignorance and racial insensitivity is. Please understand the clear delineation between that. And we're not necessarily fighting a fight against overt racists. The fight we're fighting is against the larger congregation of racial insensitivity and racial ignorance. Oh, President Obama, he wasn't black. I mean, I mean, he was like, he wasn't like black, black. But that's the stuff you hear like that. I mean, I mean, yeah, but they're not really black. Yeah, I mean, your friend, I mean, yeah, she's black, but I mean, she's not like black, black. That's the stuff we're current. That, that's the bigger issue at hand. Yes, it is a huge issue. I remember in high school, um, I listened to some music where a lot of friends were like, black people don't listen to that. I'm like, well, this black person does. And I like it. And I'm not going to stop it. And so I continue to, to continue to listen to it. So I appreciate that. Um, in your book, you mentioned somewhat of somewhat of a like a culture shock when you got to UT. Um, Tell me about that. Like, what like what was it like those first couple of weeks when you were on campus? Man, well, culture shock for two reasons. Number one, I went to an all boys school in high school, and so oh. there were now women on my campus, and I was startled. I was like, "Oh wow, huh?" Women. <laughs> um, number two, uh, I graduated with seventy five people, so my average class in my high school was about eight to twelve people. Texas, my first class, microeconomics, four hundred people. I was like, "What in the world?" But then the real crux of the shock in Texas, I'm in a locker room with majority black people, black people from the hood, black people from the country, black people from the city, black people from private school. And remember, I told y'all black by skin color, but I was not black by culture. I wasn't fully black by culture. And so I'm at Texas now and my dogs on a football team are like, hey, Acho, we finna ride through to here. I'm like, huh, we're doing what to where? Exactly. And so I, I, um, I now was like, I'm finally with my people, like yeah. people that look like me are like me. And, and, and I've used this expression before in, 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 in the movie we all grew up watching, that movie of Tarzan, where he finally was like, oh, we saw humans. And I was like, oh, my humans. I said, huh, I'm like, y'all. And so yeah. I finally felt more at home, more comfortable. And it's not to say that uh, I, well, no, I'll be honest with y'all because that's what the point of this is, it's being uncomfortable and being honest. Oftentimes as a black man in America, you navigate society as a stranger. And my white brothers and sisters, they've asked me, Emmanuel, what the heck do you mean by that? Let me put it in context. In Los Angeles right now during COVID, um, you can't really eat outside, you can't really hang out with anybody. 
But finally, the restriction was lifted like two weeks ago. And I went to a friend's house. I hadn't met them before, but we had connected via social and mutual friends. So I go over to a friend's house. And as I'm walking through their apartment, Brandon, I'm looking down like, okay, where is a coffee table? Where is a side table? Where's a nightstand? Where's a, where's a side lamp, night lamp? Because Brandon, I didn't want to knock anything over because that space yeah. was foreign to me. So I had to be very tactical about my movements because I was a stranger in that environment. In the same breath, when you're a black man in this country, oftentimes you have to be tactful about your movements because you can be viewed as a stranger in that environment. What do I mean? Brandon, if I walk outside about five hours from now, it'll be 53 or so degrees. I'll be tempted to put my hood on, but I can't. Why can't I? Because to be a black man in America wearing a hood, you are a threat, Trayvon Martin George Zimmerman. To be a large black man in America, you are perceived as a threat at certain times. And so I navigate it often as a stranger. When you get to Texas and I was finally amongst my peers that looked like me, it just felt like being home. Yeah, I bet. Um... I had a similar experience. One of the things that I found myself doing was overcompensating until I got to a place where I'm like, I just got to be me. And yeah. um, I, I felt like when I was around my black friends, my black teammates, um, I acted the way that I thought that I was supposed to act. And, you know, one of them pulled me aside, I actually turned out to be one of my best friends. And he's like, why are you talking like that? That's not, that's not you. You don't need to, you don't need to talk like we're talking like that. Cause that's who we are. That's where we're from. So, um, did you have any experience like that, or was it were, were you you the whole way through, which is would be amazing if you were? Yeah. Let's get real, Brandon. Since you asked, yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you. Why would I do that? Um, let's talk about code switching. Yeah, I know many of my white brothers and sisters haven't heard that term, so allow Brandon and I to discuss. Code switching is when a black person or any person will change the way they are around another group of people, particularly white people, to make the white people feel more comfortable. Meaning, Brandon, if I'm with my dogs, I'm gonna just talk like this. Hey, bro, you good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm chilling, man. It's all good. I can't complain. But when I'm around, you know, my white brothers and sisters, like, yes, I'm doing this. I'm great, honestly. Like, life is treating me so great. I've been blessed bountifully. I use words like bountifully. I don't even know what bountifully means, but it just sounds good. Um, oh, wow. And so, Brandon, I, I oftentimes still code switch. And, and what's the problem with that? The problem with that is the reason I code switch is because I try to make my white brothers and sisters feel more comfortable. But the real root of the problem is why does black culture and black things still make so many people feel uncomfortable? That's the root of the issue. Like, why does black culture and, and, and black vernacular at times still make white people feel and my white brothers and sisters feel uncomfortable? So ask the majority of black people have at one point in time or another code switched, even to the point where usually on a call like this, I tuck in my chain. Just because to be black and to wear a chain, you might be perceived as a thug or a gangster as one of those rappers on those music videos but in all honesty, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my guy. I'm just going to be my most authentic self. So, yes, I have had to code switch. And I would submit that most of my black brothers and sisters have as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the next topic I want to get into, which is a, a, around the show, um, you know, I think I, I guess my question is essentially what was it about the George Floyd situation that was so compelling for you to kind of like step forward and say, it's time to have this conversation. It's time for me to step up um, and say something because I not, not only do I have the platform, um, but I also have the ability to kind of like pull this thing through. Like what was it about George Floyd um, as opposed to some of the other instances of like racialized violence against black people? It's a great question, Brandon. Um, so many people, they say Emmanuel, what was your inspiration for uncomfortable conversations with a black man? For those of y'all that don't know me, uncomfortable conversations with a black man, uh, a show I created, I sat in a studio by myself and for nine minutes and 27 seconds in an all white space, I looked dead into the lens of a camera. And within five days, I had 30 million views. I now have over 80 million views on the eight or 10 episodes. I don't even recall how many I've done. Uh, and a New York Times bestselling book by the grace of God on the same topic by the same name. So, Brandon, people ask, Emmanuel, what was your inspiration? And Brandon, I reply, 
It wasn't an inspiration. It was a devastation. After George Floyd was murdered, I was walking around my house in Austin, Texas, distraught. I was like, okay, do I cry? Do I scream? Do I vent? Ah, I don't know what to do. And then I said, wait, my weapon is my voice. My voice is my sword. Brandon, true story, full authenticity. It's just me and you here, plus maybe a few hundred, potentially thousand people one day watching this. Um, I've yet to go out on a march. I've yet to spray yeah. paint a sign. I've yet to hold a sign up because my weapon of choice was a studio. And thankfully that studio has now garnered 80 million views. To put that in context, this is America's population roughly 350 to 400 million people. So my point of influence, my weapon was my voice. So it wasn't an inspiration, it was a devastation. I was devastated enough to create. And the George Floyd situation, it truly hurt me because on camera, you saw this man begging for his, his life and calling for his mother. Remember, for those of y'all that are unaware or never knew, his mother was dead. So he's calling for yeah. a woman who can't even come help him. And I've been in situations, heartless, broken, torn before where I've called out for my mother and the level of pain, agony, heartbreak, and hurt that you have to be in to call for someone who can't help you is a different kind of pain. And so that devastated me enough to speak. Yeah, and the world thanks you for it. Uh, I, like, I'm very thankful. You know, I think at that time, um, me personally, I was struggling just like most black people were. It was right on the, t on the heels of Maude Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and a few other folks. Um, you know, I have two biracial children and I'm trying to like figure, the, figure out how do I explain the world to them in this moment? And, you know, your weapon was your voice. My weapon will be them and helping them, edu helping to educate them on the way the world can be with them in it. So I, again, I thank you for um, starting this conversation and having these very difficult um, you know, topics to talk through. So with that, um, you know, if you like, I'd love to understand like what goes into the show. Like if you, like, if there are people that are on the list that um, you haven't had a chance to have a, converse, have a conversation with, like, or, or like, can you tell me a little bit more about, about that? Like, is there someone else that's out there that you wish that you could have a conversation with right now? It's a great question. First part, I love when people ask me what goes into the show. Because I'm reminded of the of people like Emmanuel, what if somebody steals your idea or steals your concept? And I'm reminded of the quote, you can watch a Bruce Lee fight, but it's gonna be hard to fight like Bruce Lee. And True. I finally realized, Brandon, like God gave me a gift, use it. And my gift is converse conversational empathy and understanding. So what goes into the show, for those that y'all have to watch it and don't do it for my sake but do it for the sake of you and your friends. You can watch it on my social media channels, on, on YouTube, et cetera. Brennan, I don't use a teleprompter. I don't use a script. Um, I just go from my head and from my heart. So the first episode, nine minutes, 27 seconds, there was nothing written down, people. The first episode I was supposed to do with a friend of mine. She drove from Dallas to Austin, three hours down Interstate 35. We rehearsed all day Saturday. We did a rehearsal in front of her mom, who's a history teacher, a rehearsal in front of her sweet sister. The next day, Brandon, an hour, six minutes before the first episode, she calls me downstairs into my own house. I had her staying in my guest room, tears in her eyes. Emmanuel, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not right. They don't want to see me. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. We've rehearsed this. I can't do it. It's not right. Finally, Brandon, I said, don't worry, I'll do it myself. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man is the title, not Uncomfortable Monologue with a Black Man. So why was I sitting there the first episode by myself? It wasn't by choice. So that's how the initial stages of it started. I rarely tell that story. Um, so now, who would I like to talk to? There's not a specific person as much as a concept. I'm trying to bridge re reconciliation. So Morgan Wallen, right? He recently, the famous country singer, he recently was caught on camera saying the N word and not even like rapping a song, kind of saying it maliciously, yeah. like it's not a good look. Um, I would love to talk to him. You know, I talked to Kyle Larson, the NASCAR driver who was caught on camera saying the N word. I talked to him right before the Daytona 500 that aired on Fox Sports. It's also on my social, but that was such yeah. a, 
a conversation limited by broadcast television. It was really a 30 minute conversation. We had to cut down into four and a half minutes. So I would love to talk to anyone who has spoken ignorantly or insensitively to educate them to bring forth healing and reconciliation. Education from my white brothers and sisters, healing and reconciliation from my black brothers and sisters. That's kind of the goal and the ethos of the show. Yeah, I think the conversation with the Morgan with Morgan Wallen would be quite interesting given the state of you know America right now and then having a, a country singer kind of talk about that. That would be quite interesting. Um, what's the most challenging thing at, like to prepare for the show? Like what's like do you get nervous before any of these? Like I watched the cop episode, I was nervous for you. Uh, you called it an audience, but it, it didn't feel like an audience. It felt like you were like like trapped in there for a second. Um, like like what's it like preparing for that? Nerve wracking, more nerve wracking than any football game I ever played in. Like I am paralyzed by my nervousness, paralyzed by it. Because think about this, Brandon, weight always dictates a struggle. I'm gonna let y'all sit on that one. Weight dictates a struggle. I used to work out a ton. I still try to work out some so I can convince people that I still play football, even though I'm long removed. Um, Weight dictates, come on now, now. you work out more than some. (laughs) Listen, so Brandon, if you get under a squat rack and you put more weight on the bar, it's gonna be harder to lift. The weight of my words are incredibly heavy in this moment. So weight, it dictates a struggle. So before every episode, I'm, I'm nervous, don't know what I'm gonna do. And I always do this before the episode. And you've seen me do this plenty of times now, it's just my stick. I, I close my eyes, I gather myself, and then I yell three, two, and I never say one. At one, I just open my eyes and go, welcome to another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And I just begin. And whatever, I go, I go blank for about 30 minutes to an hour, and I have a conversation from my heart and I try to make TV magic. Um, and so that's the not so secret sauce. Um, that's kind of just how I create it. And um, man, thankfully it, it it resonates with the world. Yeah, man, like I, I really do think um, your formula works because it, it does come across the screen as genuine um, and from the heart. And so uh, thank you again for that. Um, throughout all the episodes that you've done, um, a few have stood out, stood out to me. I think the Carl, the Carl Lynch show obviously uh, was a big deal for me. Was like, was there anything that you didn't ask some of these folks that made it to, that like didn't make it to camera? Like the cop episode, was there any questions that you didn't ask that you were too scared to ask, or you felt like you were uncomfortable to ask? <laughs> Yo, I'm never too scared to ask anything because I'm honestly the comfortable one. Like they're uncomfortable. Um, let me think. Let me think. I'll say this. The question that made me most uncomfortable, I'm sitting down with Oprah Winfrey um, on for an Oprah conversation meets an uncomfortable conversation for Apple TV. Y'all should also check that out on Apple TV. Um, And I get asked this question by a person who wanted to remain anonymous. You know you about to ask something wild when you want to remain anonymous. And Oprah says, Emmanuel, this question is from someone who wants to remain anonymous. They say the Holocaust was both more recent and more deadly than slavery, but Jewish people have been able to recover. Why can't black people get over slavery? I was like, I was hurt and frustrated by the ignorance of that question. However, I was pleased that the question was asked because somewhere this anonymous person is walking around with this ignorant thought like, hmm. I don't know why black people, why y'all can't get over this. Jewish people could get over the Holocaust. And unless that question is answered, that ignorance is perpetuated. And and so that's a better answer as I pivot to your question. I'm never really uncomfortable and I haven't shied away from asking anything, but that was the question that I was asked that was the most difficult, if you will. Yeah, I think that's a really difficult one. I, it would be hard for for me to not respond. I, I would immediately say something like, "Did you know that the Nazis based, you know, their camps off the American South?" Like, it's a it's a it's a huge it's a huge Bro, a conversation. Did you know? Yeah. Did you know that Hitler, in nineteen twenty five, I believe, while writing his manifesto, he looked at how America 
segregated its country and created a second class citizen. And that was his motivation and thought creation in creating a second class citizen. Bro, when I found that out and I did my research and I read the manifesto, I was like, yo. And then I was like, dang, I hope my white brothers and sisters realize this. Like Hitler, the horrible, horrendous, can, can everybody can agree how terrible he was. He looked to America in the 1920s and 30s and how we created second class citizens. And he said, ooh, they're doing a really good job of that. I should do that. Um, and so that was mind blowing to me. Yeah. It's still mind blowing to me. It's it's sad in such a, so many different ways. Um, one question that I that that comes up to me, and, I, and you've talked a little bit about it, is this concept of white privilege. Um, as a former athlete and someone who is famous now, um, do you think there's some similarities between like white privilege and some of the experiences that you have in your life today? <laughs> Just take a second and applaud a great question. Oh, let's go here, people. I'm so glad I get to talk to you. I'm so glad you just asked this question. Okay, everybody, let's listen up. Um, Privilege. Privilege by definition. It is um, immunity from certain punishment or special access granted to certain things. Privilege by definition. Immunity from certain punishment or special access granted to certain things. So what is the adjective that precedes the word privilege? Because that will describe the privilege we are discussing. Emmanuel Acho has, has points in my life, I'm third personing here. Emmanuel Acho has at points in his life had celebrity privilege. I'll give you an example. When I was in the NFL, I was given a celebrity card by a certain company. And the celebrity card allows me to go to the restaurant, uh, Brandon, order whatever I want every day of the year, and it is free. True story. Because of my celebrity privilege, I have access granted to this restaurant that other people do not have. But on the back of this celebrity card, it says, you can throw a party at this restaurant for 100 people annually. So what do I do, Brandon? I throw it for the homeless. Not to toot my own horn, but I use my privilege to help those who don't have it. Okay, let's come full circle to your incredible question. So then what is white privilege? See, white privilege isn't saying your life hasn't been hard as a white person. White privilege is saying your skin color hasn't contributed to the difficulty of your life. As a white person, I promise you your life has been hard because life is hard. But what is making your life hard is not your whiteness. Whereas what has made my life hard at times has been my blackness. So the universal word of privilege without any uh, uh, adjective preceding it it typically implies being rich or being wealthy. A rich person has rich person privilege. A CEO has CEO privilege. A celebrity has celebrity privilege. But when talking about white privilege, your whiteness has granted you certain access and immunity from certain situations. I'll end it by saying this. Brandon, I I live in Beverly Hills now, Beverly Hills adjacent. I don't really live in Beverly Hills. I ain't got Beverly Hills money, but I got Beverly Hills adjacent money. Um, so like I knock on the stores of Beverly Hills, people like, oh, hey, I'm over here. Um, and by living in Beverly Hills adjacent, there's a mall, Brandon, next to me about two miles away. One day I'm biking to this mall and I'm lying there. Couldn't get there faster. And it's crazy because I'm like, huh, I must be in better shape. But Brandon, when I was biking, biking back, I was working so hard and not going very fast. See, the problem was biking back home, I was biking into a tailwind. A headwind, rather. And going to the mall, I had a tailwind behind me. See, I submit that white privilege is kind of like living life with that tailwind. You don't even recognize it's there until you got to go into a headwind. Because when I was going to the mall, I didn't think anything was helping me. I was cruising. I thought it was all my own work until I had to go home in that headwind. And and being Black in America is often like, Biking into a headwind. Okay, Emmanuel, you're just talking. Oh, am I? Let's use empirical data. Equal resumes. The person with the black sounding name has a 50% chance of getting the job compared to the person with the white sounding name. Said differently, the person with the white sounding name is twice as likely to get the job as the person with the black sounding name. This is not Emmanuel Acho's opinion. This is based on empirical data and facts in a study. So white privilege, again, isn't saying your life hasn't been hard. 
It's just saying your skin color hasn't contributed to it. I have privilege. I have celebrity privilege. I have able-bodied privilege. Um, I have educational privileges. Uh, and that has to be known as well. We all have privilege. Absolutely. Um, we, got, we got a few more minutes before we head to some of the audience questions. But there is one thing um, that I want to talk to you about. Uh, obviously, you know, I, you played for the Eagles. I worked for the Eagles. I've been in that locker room. Um, I understand what players go through. I, I, I see the day in and day out stuff. Uh, in your book, you talk a little bit about the Riley Cooper situation. Um, can you give a quick overview for the folks who don't know what that is and just kind of like what your thought process was during that period of time? Um, I lived on a different coast during that time. When I heard what happened, I was like, oh, that dude's going to not, he's not making it to tomorrow morning. He's going to get killed. Um, what was it like for real uh, in, the, in the locker room during that time? So Riley Cooper, he was my homeboy, um, about a 6'4", 215 pound white dude, played at the University of Florida when the University of Florida was winning national championships alongside Tim Tebow. And um, I'm in the locker room one day and I get this video on my phone and I see it and it's a video of Riley Cooper. He's at a Kenny Chesney concert and he's arguing with somebody a little belligerent and he says, I'll jump over this fence and fight every N word in here. And he said it with the hard E-R. For those of y'all that don't know the difference, please buy my book and read chapter six. The N-word with the hard E-R is the worst iteration of the N-word. And there is no acceptable iteration by a white person. He says, I'll jump over this fence and fight every N-word in here. I'm in the locker room at that time and I'm like, uh-oh, this isn't good. He hadn't been there that day, but I was like, yo, when Riley shows up, people are about to throw hands. Um, our head coach, Chip Kelly, Gave him like 10 days off to like go learn or like rethink his thoughts. I don't know. Mind you, we're in the middle of training camp. Getting 10 days off is like a gift from the gods. Training camp yeah. is the hardest part of your life. You're waking up at 5 a.m., going to sleep at 11 p.m., practices. It's terrible. At the end of the season, Riley Cooper got a five-year, $25 million extension. Now, he ended up playing fairly well that season. But to think like, man, you can get away with yeah, just whatever you want to in our society. So that was a very weird, trying, and um, complicated time, particularly for Black people. Yeah, uh, to me, it just screams white privilege um, in, in an un unintentional way, most likely. But um, that's the thing, like, you know, look at, look at the, the, the difference between Colin Kaepernick and that, and that's, that's very different of uh, repercussions for sure. Um, Absolutely. With, with that, though, I, I do want to ask one more question before we go to the audience. Um, I lived in Philly, clearly. Um, Philly is a very interesting town. Uh, it's the fourth largest market in the country. Um, there's a lot of people there. Uh, what were your impressions of like race, cult, race and culture as an athlete once you lived there? You know, Philly is an interesting city because you have a plethora of races, a lot of Italian, a lot of black, a lot of whatever, plethora of backgrounds, races, cultures. Um, and you, what I learned there is the difference in cultures, which I learned to appreciate. Like that Italian culture is strong. Um, it's incredibly strong. And so I was in South Philly, uh, which is just like totally yeah. different. Like that's not, you know what I'm saying? Like I was in South Philly. Um, but I loved my time in Philly uh, and it served me well. And it really just broadened my horizons of understanding, which leads me to uh, th the more you know, the better you can be for other people. So if your life isn't currently diversified, if your life isn't currently uh, exposed to different cultures and understandings, make sure it is so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so now let's, I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions over here. It says, um, if you could help them, and I'm going to ask direct questions from um, Sean Irich. Uh, it says, if you could help Google move the needle internally on diversity, equity, and inclusion, what would you do? Sheesh. Um, well, one, I would get paid a lot of money to do so because Google's <laughs> a huge brand. Um, but no, in all seriousness, what would I do? Um, I would say this. One, I would understand that what is the difference between diversity and inclusion? We throw out phrases like that, but we don't simplify them so people can understand. Diversity being invited to the dance, inclusion being asked to dance. Brandon, I'm not going to a dance to sit there in the corner and drink punch. 
And that's what so many companies do. Oh yes, we have black people here. We have women here. We have Asian Americans here. Of course we do. But then they don't feel included while they are there. So the experience suffers, it lacks. I was in a small group in Austin, Texas. I was one, I was the only black person there or one of two. And I didn't feel comfortable because they would still make fun of my vernacular, because fun of my speech. So finally I was just like, yeah, I'm going to stop going. Because while it had attempted to be diverse, it was not inclusive. And we have to make sure we're doing both. The last thing I would submit is very simple. Let the minority groups have more of a say so, at least in your education. You can't, you have to know that you don't know. So maybe the first of every month or once a month, I would let the, 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 the black people or the minority group speak to the leaders. Hey, this is how we feel our experience has been different this month. Let the women speak up. Hey, this is how we feel we've been treated differently. You don't know what you don't know. There's a reason there's something called a blind spot when you're driving in a vehicle because you can't necessarily see it. So let your minority speak to your blind spots in your company. Got it. Got it. Have you ever considered having a conversation with um, you know, a black audience or a, a black man? Um, his idea was, would you ever have a conversation with you, T.O., Ocho Cinco, Primetime, uh, and a few other folks about uh, race in America and specifically related to, um, you know, athletes? Um, man, um, let me digest this. I have an episode of Double Standards, Refreshing Black Athletes Have or Non-Black Humans. Um, let me get to... Yes, I would obviously have that conversation, but I always like to get to the crux of the conversation. When I first met Oprah, and let's leave the question up there if we can. When I first met Oprah, Oprah asked me one question. Brandon, she said, Emmanuel, what is your intention? She said, what is your intention for, for, for conversations? And I said, Oprah, I want to be a catalyst to change the world, and I truly believe I can. I said, I'm working on writing a book. She said, books? I love books. Uh, and that's how Uncomfortable Convos came to be. True story. I can't make this up. And so when I when I think about the double standards of expression of Black athletes have versus their non-Black teammates, uh, that's that's an intriguing concept because within locker rooms, what I found is this, and, and I'll answer this question so y'all can remove that question. What I found in locker rooms is the difference in an NFL locker room or any locker room, you understand the common opponent. See, when the Philadelphia Eagles march out into the field, they know the Dallas Cowboys are their opponent. But the problem, Brandon, in our society, we're confused on the opponent. We think it's black versus white. We think it's man versus woman. When in all honesty, it's love versus hate. It's good versus evil. It's oppressor versus the oppressed. And so, Brandon, if, if I were to walk out on the field in an Eagles uniform and you saw us start to tackle each other in green, you'd be like, yo, what the heck is going on here? Because we need to fight the common opponent. And in our society, we have to get to a point of fighting the common opponent and understand who exactly the opponent is. It's not black, white. It's not man, woman. It's good versus evil. It's love versus hate. I love that. That's a, that's a perfect answer. Um, sorry, Kevin, again, for uh, not even pronouncing your last name. Um, the next question is from Farah Nesbeth. Um, what's been the most insightful episode to record for uh, your YouTube series? That's fair, a great question. And I will say this, I think it depends who you ask. For those who haven't watched, let me just kind of run down the list and then I'll give you my personal answer. First episode was by myself, 30 million views. I think it captivated people. Um, I answered four questions. How come black people can say the N-word, but white people can't? What is white privilege? Um, but Emmanuel, what about black on black crime in Chicago? How come black people don't care about that? And then why are black people rioting? Then I got a call from no caller ID number five days later. I picked it up. Acho, McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. Like, <laughs> McConaughey? Like Matthew McConaughey? Um, McConaughey and I sit down and we talk about a, a, a phrase um, he had heard uh, it slipped my mind right now, but uh, white something, I forget the phrase that he used. McConaughey and I talk about um, whiteness and, and the advantage of that. Then I sit down with Chip and Joanna Gaines and their children. Chip and Joanna Gaines reach out to me. They said, Emmanuel, we have one request, one prerequisite before we come on your show. I said, anything. They said, we want our children to come on. 
Then episode five, I jumped past four. Episode four is a solo episode. I think episode five is my favorite. Brandon, it likely is yours based on the energy I'm feeling of you. I sat down with two white parents raising yeah. their white biological son, two black adopted children from Haiti, and their yeah. mixed domestic adoption child. And that episode was crazy, y'all. Tears were shed. I asked the black daughter who was adopted from Haiti, 12 years old, I asked her with her white parents sitting there, do you wish your parents raising you were black or looked like you? That was the most uncomfortable I had been in totality. Because if yeah. she says yes, her mom about to cry. If she yeah. says no, her mom about to cry. Either way, mom and dad are about to cry. And sweet story, 12 years old at the time said, no, Emmanuel, I just want people to love me for me. Um, after that, I sat down with commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell. We talked about Colin Kaepernick. I sat down with two interracial couples, a black woman married to a white man and a white woman dating a black man. Because there's a difference, Brandon, you know this. Interracial oh, yeah. couples get looked at differently. Y'all get judged differently. And it's more acceptable for a black man to be with a white woman than a black woman to be with a white man. I'm going to be real with y'all right now. So I had to have that conversation about the judgment around there. I sat down with Chelsea Handler. We talked about um, cancel culture, white privilege, this concept of Karens. And then lastly, I sat down with the Petaluma Police Department. It's a uh, Petaluma is outside of San Francisco or Oakland, California, population of 60,000, but less than 1% black. And I talked about the issues in our society. Um, so my favorite, either the cop episode or the episode um, with the adopted children. Yeah, the adopted children episode was hard for me to watch. Uh, quite honestly, I try. I, it, it, there was definitely tears uh, by myself sitting in front of this computer. So uh, thank you for having that conversation. It was it was good. Um, next question is coming from. Wine, were you just like, were you just crying, just solo, just you know? Did you at least like crying with wine? You know, anything, popcorn, <laughs> something. You know. Uh, no alcohol. No, I, I, this is a work thing. So no, I don't drink alcohol when I. When I'm <laughs> I did schedule some time for you to watch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, um, I wanted to make sure I watched all the episodes, but I knew that one was going to be touch, tough for me. Um, so I watched it alone, and uh, which is sort of telling. But yeah, I did watch it, and it was really good. Uh, next question is actually coming from Kumail. Um, he said, would love to learn what inspired you to give so, give so much in life. Uh, between your books, show, and service in Nigeria, you realize your realize your impact goes beyond uh, a sports host and NFL alumni. Hook them forever, man. Hook them, uh, my friend Kumel. Oh, I'm gonna give y'all two things that I hope stick with you. The first, more is caught than is taught. More is caught than is taught. My parents uh, were born and raised in Nigeria. They go on med medical mission trips with 40 doctors and nurses to Nigeria every summer. We finally built a hospital after nine years of fundraising, cost us $2 million. I watched my parents give back every single summer. In all honesty, every day of their life, I caught that. I've never drank alcohol to this day. True story, I have no reason to lie to y'all, never have. Um, not because my parents ever told me not to, I just never saw my parents do it. They never drank. So I, to this day, haven't drank. I don't really curse often. Not because anybody ever told me, hey, Emmanuel, don't curse. My parents never cursed. So I caught all of those things. So if you want to be a great employer, if you want to be a great father, if you want to be a great spouse, if you want to be a great mother, it's not about what you say. It's about what you do. Your actions speak so loud, I can't hear what you're telling me. More is caught than it's taught. The second thing I will say is this. I told you my first uh, no caller ID call was Matthew McConaughey. Oh, great. I got a call five days later after that. Picked it up. Hey, Emmanuel, Oprah Winfrey's team. I'd love to have a conversation. My next no caller ID call was Oprah. My third no caller ID call, Emmanuel, this is Roger Goodell, commissioner of the NFL. I say this, Brandon, your calling will call you. Yeah. Pick up. See, Absolutely. these no caller ID numbers, they kept calling me and I picked them up. I, a sports was my profession, it was my career. Uncomfortable conversations and being a gap for racial reconciliation, that is my calling. Your career is what you're paid for, your calling is what you're made for. Sometimes they intertwine, sometimes they do not. So to answer Kumail's question, I found my calling 
while in the midst of my career. Cool. That's, that's great. Um, I do have another question for you with regards to like the corporate America. Like what's, what is the biggest thing corporations should do to like foster their own uncomfortable conversations? Not only just like hearing from, um, you know, people of color or um, what I once was, was told was called at risk communities um, within uh, corporate America. Like what do you think we should be doing to foster our own conversations, own, own uncomfortable conversations? Create a climate that caters to this dialogue. You got to create a climate and a culture. If your employees do not feel comfortable speaking to you, they will speak about you. Let me give you all a practical example. The Dallas Cowboys. I'm fond of the Dallas Cowboys because I was born and raised in Dallas. About four weeks into their season, Dallas Cowboys football team, for those that don't care anything about sports, about four weeks into their season, leaks were had in the locker room that players were disgruntled with the head coach. Those things were being leaked to the media. And that was being leaked to the media because players didn't feel comfortable going to the head coach and talking to him directly. It's the same thing in corporations. If you, the CEO, don't create a culture where your employees feel comfortable talking to you, then they will just talk about you. So you have to create a atmosphere and a climate where you say, hey, open door policy. And if you don't have the time or the bandwidth, an open door policy every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, whatever the case may be. It's one thing to have me, an outsider, come talk to you, but make sure your yeah. people can talk to you too. Yes, very important. Thank you for saying that. Last question uh, we have from Kayla Kilwine. Um, what's the answer to trying to get people to see the world from other people's eyes or experiences? I've had a really difficult, I've had really difficult convos with friends who have stayed in small white towns and it's impossible. <laughs> um, Kayla, let me say this. Um, a gentle answer turns away wrath, right? A gentle answer turns away wrath. That's the first thing. Somebody comes to you all upset. Oh my God, Brandon, I can't believe you said that. I love you, my friend. Did he just say he loved See, there's a reason on my first episode, I say, um, consider this a safe space, my white brothers and sisters. I don't use brothers and sisters because I have no other words to use. Brother and sister is a term of endearment. It, yeah. it, 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 it initially implies there's an endearment here. I care about you. I could say, hey, white people, I'm talking to you. That's so different. Kayla, the other thing I would submit Start with facts. Facts can't be debated. After the war, mid 1950s, black people were thrown into red line districts. Red line districts were not given proper financing from banks. Two ways historically in America to acquire wealth, property and education. So if black people were thrown into red lined areas which couldn't get bank loans, then that means the property has now lost its value. Two ways in America to acquire wealth, property and education. We just got rid of runway property, which leaves one more, education. Remember, 50% of public school education is funded by property and property taxes. Therefore, if black people in the 1950s lost their ability to properly acquire property and property funds into education, then we just lost both. Yeah. So remember that we're not talking about opinions. We're talking about facts. I would start with facts and I would maintain grace. I love that. I love that. Uh, we're, we're almost at the end and there is a question I'm going to ask, like I want to ask, but um, like I'll just, I'll just, it, it'll be a pitch, I guess. It won't be, it's from John Knack. Uh, it just came through. Uh, and during the pandemic, uh, I bought a Peloton like a lot of folks did. Uh, it basically saved my life. Uh, the question is, uh, would you ever consider doing a conversation with someone uh, like Tunde uh, from Tunde. Peloton? <laughs> Uh, I see that you avoided that last name too, Brandon. Uh, oh, <laughs> was like, oh, 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 <laughs> I think it's Oyen. Oh, yeah, um, but I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you make it because I'm Nigerian, so I should know how to pronounce it. Uh, man, so first off, shout out to Tunde. I've never, I've never ridden pellet, ridden road. Huh. I've never been on a peloton. Um, but I am open to conversations with anyone. The trick is always this: what's the intention? And that's kind of how, that's the crux of this conversation. What's the intention? Because if I want to have a micro conversation, I want it to have a macro impact. 
So if I'm talking to one person, I want it to have collateral damage on hearts and on minds. So it's never about, hey, Emmanuel, would you talk to this person? Would you talk to that person? I'm speaking to one person through that person to the world. Yeah. I only sp- I was speaking through Chelsea Handler to the world. I was speaking through the police department to the world. I wasn't just speaking to Chelsea. I was speaking yeah. to the world through Chelsea. And that's the, the, the intention of my conversation. Well, as someone who sees Tune Day at least once a week, uh, it would be a great conversation. Um, last question I have before we get get out, get you out of here. Um, obviously, I work for Google, YouTube. Uh, what product um, or, or service is like your go-to for Google or YouTube? Yo, one shout out to the Google Nest Wi-Fi router. Um, I sold my house, again, Beverly Hills adjacent, not Beverly Hills. If I was in Beverly Hills, I probably wouldn't have this issue. But I have a three-story townhouse. And on the second floor and the third floor, my Wi-Fi strong, strong. It would be working out. But on the first floor, yo, my Wi-Fi so suspect. So I had to buy like the Nest Wi-Fi router, put it on the first floor as soon as you walk in, put it on the second floor right next to the original router, and it's genuinely saved my life. That's probably why my Wi-Fi is strong on this conversation right now. So that would be my favorite product. Great. Shout out, shout out to the Nest Wi-Fi team. Great, great job. Um, so anyway, thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, I'll go back to something I said at the very beginning. On behalf of you know black folks almost everywhere, thank you for you know expanding this conversation into white na- like white neighborhoods, white television screens, white living rooms. We really appreciate it. Keep going. You're doing amazing things. We're all cheering for you. Congratulations. I've really enjoyed this. My brother, thank you, man. Absolutely.